I'm really excited to be here today uh, to remember military courage through confrontation. I'd like to present a brief overview of the history of Blacks in the military. The anti-Black sentiment in the Canadian military Racism, a systemic problem in the Canadian military. Pre-Confederation slaves and prejudiced sideline blacks, initial involvement in military confrontations, we were not trusted to be regimented and loyal. They just didn't think we were. Blacks battled racism and hatred to first fight for their own freedom in order to help their fellow nationals gain liberty from Great Britain. In World War I, African and Canadians were told, this is a white man's war. You are not wanted or needed. Chief of the General Staff, General W.G. Gwetin, opposed African-Canadian enlistment. In the midst of a recruiting crisis in 1916, however, he wrote, the civilized Negro is vain and imitative. In Canada, he is not impelled to enlist by a high sense of duty. In the trenches, he is not likely to make a good fighter. Those were his opinions only. In World War II, at the start of 1946, the Royal Canadian Air Force reinstated the requirement that applicants from Black, Oriental, and former enemy aliens be forwarded to headquarters for approval. Denying there were restrictions placed upon the eligibility of colored applicants, the chief of the air staff claimed colored applicants had to be sent to headquarters to carefully scrutinize whether the applicant could mix with whites, which was for the protection and future welfare of the applicant. The policy was still employed in the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1956. Now in this 21st century, anti-blackness is a significant problem in the Canadian forces. For decades it was explicit and the institution eventually remained structurally racist and this is even up until 2019, and I would say today. I'm having a little technical uh, inappropriateness. African Canadians have a long, proud history of service in uniform. From the days before Canada was even its own country to the current efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq, the sacrifices and achievements of African Canadians have shone through. Their struggle for acceptance and equality has been hard won. They persevered to make their mark. The pictures show the War of 1812, Richard Pierpont, who fought in four wars. We'll talk about that a little later. Number two, the 1860s of the Victoria Rifles in Victoria, BC. And this unit actually predated the Royal Canadian Mounties for policing in that region. Again in the 1860s, number three, Civil War volunteers. 
over 400,000 men and troops died in that war. Blacks were not wanted. They escaped, particularly when Sherman's troops went through and um, begged to help. And they were very useful. They knew the territory. They knew the lay of the land. They were able to help win the Civil War. Number four, 1916 World War and Expeditionary Forces in France. Uh, the second battalion, which was founded in Windsor, Nova Scotia, was made up of black men from across Canada, and we'll talk about that a little later, but it is untrue that they never fought during the war. They did. In the 1940s, is a picture of a soldier in Europe. Many African Canadians enlisted, again, begged to join, and saw service on the European frontier, my father being one of them. And during this century, the 200s, uh, the Royal Canadian Regina, the ship Regina, here's a picture of a female seaman, maybe calling home, talking to a loved one, missing them just as, did, as soldiers did throughout all of these centuries of confrontation. A proud fighting history. The whole of colonized North America, including Canada, were British subjects when the American 13 colonies decided to break away from the oppressive grip of King George III. The ex-slaves who fought with the British during the Revolutionary War are pictured below in 1776. They were the first Rhode Island Regiment integrated revolutionary force. That's to say they were not segregated. They fought alongside of white loyalists as well. That is, whites loyal to Great Britain. The first Continental Army unit largely comprised of New England blacks showcased African-American skill as soldiers and commitment to their brethren on the battlefield. In the late 1770s, dwindling manpower forced George Washington to consider his original decision to ban blacks from the Continental Army. So, in 1778, a Rhode Island legislator declared that both free and enslaved blacks could serve. To attract the latter, that is, the enslaved blacks, the Patriots promised freedom at the end of service. That didn't always take place. In the picture on the right is Richard Pierpont. He was captured in Bondu in Africa at age 16. Captain Dick was a veteran of four wars, the French and Indian Wars, the War of Independence, the War of 1812, and the Rebellion of 1837-38. He was a true African-Canadian military hero who helped shape today's Canada. War of 1812, the black struggle continued. 1812, slavery still existed on the North American continent, even here in Canada. That's, that's largely why there was such a struggle about placing blacks with guns in the military. But in 1812, that changed. When the Yankees attacked and tried to overrun Canada, Richard Pierpont proposed the formation of a black fighting unit to General Brock a corps of colored men. A small militia unit was formed and became known as the Colored Corps or Captain Runchy's Colored Corps. Pierpont, who had fought with the British in the American Revolutionary War, 
was one of over 50 who served in that unit through the war. They were um, initially put together in Niagara-on-the-Lake. While the commanding officers were white, six of the enlisted men served as sergeants or corporals, and the rest served as privates. But that was revolutionary to have black men gaining rank and an exclusive situation at that time. There were both free and enslaved men in the Colored Corps ranks. And they had a vested interest. Because some were enslaved and some had escaped from slavery, they were dedicated to keeping Canada from becoming a part of the United States again and being enslaved again. The Colored Corps saw action in some of the best known battles in the War of 1812. At the Battle of Queenston Heights, they participated in the recapture of the Redden Battery affair after the death of Major General Sir Isaac Brock. In the years following the war, Colored Corps veterans worked hard at getting back pay and their pensions. The records indicate that these claims were still being settled well into the 1820s and early 1830s. In fact, getting what was owed was often left to their widows and children, as many Colored Corps veterans de died before receiving what was due them. The unit's history and heritage is perpetuated in the modern Canadian Army by the Lincoln and Welland regiments. Let's just take a minute here. You see these men holding guns? Imagine the Yankees scaling Queenston Heights, coming face to face, very possibly with a former slave they had owned holding a gun. That would be a pretty frightening sight, and it certainly helped the Canadians win the war. The beginning of the fabled Underground Railroad. True conflict and resistance, and that was in the late 1700s until 1865. When you look at the map, you can see the Underground Railroad was international. North American slaves resisted their bondage for 500 years. During the War of Independence, the Underground Railroad was invented and flourished. Many ex-slaves and freed blacks were promised land in Canada if they served with the British. They forged routes to New Canaan, Canada, and assisted others to freedom along waterways and along Aboriginal trails. Our Indigenous brothers and sisters were very helpful to us during the Underground Railroad era. The Great Sauk Trail, which ends here in Amherstburg, was one of the routes they took traveling north, south, west, and east. They dispersed globally, even back to Mother Africa. If you look at the map, It was a very, very vigorous and healthy process. And hundreds of thousands of people in bondage and oppressed tried to gain final freedom in many areas of the world, not just Canada, but those of us who are descendants of slaves are very proud of the fact that our families trekked here on the Underground Railroad. You'll see the Gateway to Freedom International Memorial to the Underground Railroad, which is located in Hart Plaza in Detroit, Michigan. They're looking towards freedom. They're waiting for that ferry to take them to New Canaan and Freedom Land. The second is the Tower of Freedom at Charlie Park, Plaza in Windsor. They're giving praise to standing on free soil. 
with a babe in arms who will be a free citizen for the bulk of their life. And again, the map of the Underground Railroad made these things come to fruition. World War I was called the Great War, the war to end all wars, or so people thought. Black Canadians have a long and honorable tradition of patriotism, sacrifice, and heroism in the British and Canadian Armed Forces. And I said that earlier, and I took the time to repeat it now, because they were still struggling. Following the outbreak of the First World War, black Canadians flocked to recruiting stations. From Nova Scotia to British Columbia, hundreds of black volunteers, eager and willing to serve, were turned away from enlisting in what they were told again and very emphatically, was a white man's war. The second construction battalion was created after several appeals and protests to top military officials. It's a picture of the second battalion in Windsor, Nova Scotia. The second construction battalion, Canadian Expeditionary Forces, um, of which my great uncle John Madison was one, also known as the Black Battalion, was authorized on the 5th of July, 1916. It was a segregated non-combatant unit. Although I've already stated some black men did go to Europe and they weren't just ditch diggers and kitchen help, they did fight. And it was an all black battalion the only all-black battalion in Canadian military history. Men from all over the North American continent and the West Indies were in this battalion. The battalion was granted special authority to recruit throughout Canada. Nova Scotia provided the largest group with more than 300 recruits. Enlistments also came, as I said, from the United States. Former Buffalo soldiers were in the 2nd Battalion and the British West Indies. African Canadians simply refused to be sidelined. Essex and Kent counties were full of enthusiastic young men impatient to fight against tyranny. Seeing themselves as loyal British subjects, they refused to be robbed of their opportunity to stand up and fight for freedom. Arthur Alexander from North Buxton, Ontario, wrote the military demanding answers. He questioned denying and deliberately snubbing black involvement in the First World War, Alexander wrote. November 6th, 1914, a bit over for a hundred years ago today, the Honorable Minister of Militia and Defense, Ottawa. Dear Sir, the colored people of Canada want to know why they are not allowed to enlist in the Canadian militia. I am informed that several who have applied for enlistment in the Canadian Expeditionary Forces have been refused for no other reason than their color, as they are physically and mentally fit. Thank you in advance for any information that you will give in regard to this matter. I remain yours respectfully. Arthur Alexander, North Buxton, Ontario. Because of activists like Arthur Alexander and pressure from the black community, Coupled with need for able-bodied soldiers, the Canadian military decided upon a compromise of sorts. By 1916, many Eurocentric soldiers, that is white soldiers who volunteered in Canada, had gone to Europe and had been killed. 
New Brunswick's unit was completely, I'll say almost completely wiped out. Only a few came home. And so they did need able-bodied men. The decision to allow African-Canadian recruits to join was left up to the individual commanding officers. The individual commanding officers stated, most blacks accepted were sent to the Western Front with the Canadian Expeditionary Forces. Individual blacks were permitted to enlist in such local regiments as would accept them. This was written by Robin Winks. Private Jacobs, James Jacobs of Essex was an infantryman in the 18th Battalion, Western Ontario Canadian Expeditionary Forces and fought in France. Jacobs became a postal worker in Windsor after the war. And I'll take you back to his picture superimposed on the 2nd Battalion. Blacks in the Second World War, again, volunteers were turned away in Windsor, Ontario. I remember stories my father and some of his colleagues, Uncle Josh Gross, Kenneth B. Jacobs, would tell about being refused. However, he became Private Morris Harding and he served in the Royal Canadian Rifles on the European Front as a sharpshooter and worked in military stores doling out supplies. He was wounded and received medals of commendation for his service. My dad used to scuttle for coal after it got dark on no man's land, men would go out and look for coal because often they had very scarce supplies and they risked their lives to do that. And that's when my father was wounded and he was in a military hospital for a short while. And on upon return to Windsor, Harding took electrical training at the St. Luke's Barracks on Drulard Road here in Windsor, where he obtained his master electrical papers in one and a half years. That was generally a seven year process. And in March of 1947, he and his wife, my mother Ruth, opened Harding Electric, which they operated for 41 years. The Hardings also built a home with the assistance of the VA bill. The property that my parents finally purchased in what was then Sandwich West on Mark Street was earmarked that no Negroes, Jews, or people who had committed treason against the country were allowed to buy. Now, Canada fought against Germany in the Second World War. A dear friend of my father, a born Canadian of German descent, John Steffen, purchased the property and sold it to my parents for one dollar love and affection. Of course, my father gave John the money for the property, but here was a man who had, was a decorated veteran who was excluded from buying property. That phrase was taken out of deeds in 1961. Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth B. Jacobs served in the Royal Canadian Medical Corps in World War II. He was an operating room assistant at Vancouver Military Hospital. On April 1, 1975, Kenneth B. Jacobs became the first Canadian of African descent to be promoted to the rank of a lieutenant colonel. And before his retirement, Lieutenant Colonel Jacobs was the head of the entire social work program for the Canadian military worldwide. He has material in exhibit here at the museum. Post-World War II, 
Korea, the Cold War, Cyprus, Afghanistan, and beyond. Every day is Remembrance Day. That's what this chat has really honestly been about. Since the end of World War II, the tradition of Black Canadian service in the military has expanded and evolved. In the Korean War, 1950-53, Canadians re returned to the battlefield scarcely five years after the end of the Second World War, traveling halfway around the world to join the United Nations forces fighting to restore peace in Korea. As you know today, there is still a North Korea and a South Korea. Black soldiers were among the Canadian Army troops that were sent to fight so far away from home. There were Windsor Blacks who fought in Korea. While some last traces of discrimination continue in the Canadian military, recruiting practices began to improve in the mid-1950s. Now, when Korea broke out, the Canadian military contacted my father, Morris Harding, and asked him if he would teach electricity to soldiers. My father refused on the grounds that he would not make black troops particularly, but any troops, fodder for a cannon. He was quite bitter about the fact that blacks were never honored when they returned and were never mentioned when all the glory seeking was found by the Canadian military. Black Canadians became more established in the Royal Canadian Navy and Royal Canadian Air Force as well and began receiving elevated rank across the military. Blacks were no longer just grunt privates. Over the decades since the Korean War, Black Canadians have gone on to serve in every branch of the military in duties both here and at home in operations across the world during the Cold War and international peace support efforts right from the first large-scale United Nations peacekeeping mission in Egypt during the Suez crisis in the 1950s. Others manned the dew line, distant early warning line in the Arctic, protecting Canadians against the Soviets during the Cold War. A very dear friend of mine, Everett Mulder CD, which means Canadian decorated, was in Cyprus. Today, black Canadians stand on the shoulders of the trailblazers, the black trailblazers, who led the way to continue to serve proudly in uniform where they share in the sacrifices and achievements being made by the Canadian forces. Young veterans like Hunter Kersey, Mike Akpata, and I'm sure veterans that you know have served and have come back and proudly presented themselves. Our country's af efforts in Afghanistan have come at a high cost. My nephew, Richard Harding, who is a master electrician, served two tours of duty in Afghanistan as a tradesperson attached to the military. And he saw many of his friends die. Our country's efforts really did come at a high cost. However, our black Canadians efforts came at even a higher cost and they should be held in very, very high esteem for their courage and the fact that African Canadians successfully fought to fight in the armed services. We represent the black thread in the Canadian tapestry and we continue to serve with valor. Now here are some recommended readings. 
The Black Battalion, 1916 to 20, Canada's Best Kept Military Secret, Calvin Ruck, who was a senator in Nova Scotia. The Black Presence in the War of 1812, written by myself and available here at the museum. Left, right, marching to the beat of Imperial Canada by Eve Engler and Canada's Black Battalion, number two construction, also Calvin Rook. Some of the um, books about black history are rather difficult to find, but it is worth your while to go out and look for them. Go on Amazon. Um, you can find a lot of uh, books that aren't readily available, but I recommend that you do it because the reads are fabulous. I want to take a moment. It isn't Veterans Day, but I would like to honor the black military who gave their lives for you and I to be able to sit here today peacefully and quietly to live our lives. Thank you for your attention. I understand I have a few questions. I'm trying to get to them. Please bear with me. While we're waiting, as a little girl, I used to wear my dad's Glengarry cap around the house and uh, got chastened for it. But it just made me feel so brave. And I'd look at his medals. I have them framed in my home today. Um, we can take so much pride in what these men and women did because there were women involved in all those confrontations, whether on the battlefield or making tanks, planes, uh, Windsor, Ontario had a plant making military provisions, and of course, our auto plants. So great. And I look at his medals, I have them framed in my making military provisions, and of course, That's okay. I apologize for my technology or lack of it, but we'll get to the questions in a minute. Everybody in the world is using the internet these days, and it's really slow in a lot of places. <laughs> 
the percentage is not loading. Um, so here's a comment from uh, Barb Porter. Um, she said, Elise, thank you for your very informative presentation. Several of my family members served in the military, as you know, growing up around uncles from the First and Second World War. They never spoke of um, their experiences. Was it the same with members of your family who served, and why was that? Members of my family who served in the First and Second World War talked about it. Um, my family have always been very open, and particularly with my father, we'd sit up all night and sit and chat. I was very, very fortunate. He shared with me being prejudiced against. His military papers read funny colored. They wouldn't call him Negro or Black, but funny colored. Um, the ranks were segregated when they got to uh, England in particular. And he also shared with me the story I shared with you about going out on the no man's land after dark collecting coal. He also told stories of his fellow military men being killed right beside him. One of the pictures that I showed on the very first um, panel showed my dad, it's, it's my most favorite picture of him. He's standing next to a window looking out. Um, his kit is rolled up behind him on the bunk bed, and he's shipping out from Camp Borden, and he's wondering if he'll ever come home. He's wondering if he'll be a good and loyal soldier. He feared what he was getting into, but he wanted me to know that he promised his God and that's exactly how he called it. When, if he were allowed to return home, he would be a good husband and father, and he would be a good soldier, and he made it. <laughs>